Hey everyone, this is Peter Hafner, Certified Financial Planner and Certified Financial Fiduciary. And today we've invited Don Miska back. Don is our favorite elder law attorney. Um, she's got over 25 years experience and she's with the firm of Fallsgraf, Beinhauer, Greer and Harris in Cheektowaga. So Don, it's nice to see you again. How are you? Hi Peter, nice to see you again as well. Uh, great. So, Don, let's just dive into this. As often happens, different questions come up as I'm having uh, meetings and conversations with clients. And one thing that kind of came up that hasn't come up in a long time is a living trust. And I think the reason I don't see living trusts as much as I used to is twofold. It's because estate tax exemptions have increased and because of the prevalence of the transfer on death designations for brokerage accounts and bank accounts and these kinds of things. But you're the expert. You tell me what's going on with living trusts and why aren't we seeing that? Why aren't I seeing them as much as I uh, used to, do you think? Well, there, there's different types of living trusts. You have your revocable living trusts which this sort of ties into what you were talking about. Um, not seeing too many of those, seeing a lot of transfer on death accounts. Um, so the, the revocable living trust is just basically to protect your assets to avoid probate, okay? That's the purpose of the revocable living trust. Another type of a living trust is the irrevocable living trust and the irrevocable living trust is where you're putting your house you're putting assets in to shelter those assets from medicaid so as far as what i've been seeing i have been seeing of course a lot more of the irrevocable trust in place to protect people's assets from medicaid and also avoid probate all right, so revocable or irrevocable will both avoid probate, correct? That's correct. Yep, that's correct. Okay, but you're saying only an irrevocable will shelter you from Medicaid, correct? That is correct, yep. Okay, this, this leads into another uh, question then. This, as we were looking at the various assets these clients had, um, we were looking at beneficiary designations, which is really important to do to review beneficiary designations, as you know. And what we saw is that they had a variable annuity that did not have the uh, trust as the beneficiary. But so so I think it doesn't matter if the purpose of the if the trust was a revocable living trust. But if it's an irrevocable living trust, I think it's going to be really important that that annuities beneficiaries are the irrevocable living trust. Is that correct? Right. I mean, when when clients are doing their their planning for avoiding probate, um, Medicaid asset protection, um, with regard to funding the trust, you you really. You, you shouldn't fund the, the, the trust with your, uh, with your retirement assets. You can, name your, um, you can name the trust as a beneficiary under your retirement accounts, but you really shouldn't change the ownership of your retirement accounts in the name of your, of your living trust. Okay, so you're, what you're assuming is the variable annuity is a qualified variable annuity. Yes. Which yes. means it's an IRA basically versus a non IRA. It can be either or. So are you saying if it's a non IRA variable annuity and someone has an irrevocable living trust that the annuity should not be in the individual names of the clients, but it should be in the name of the irrevocable trust? No, no. The the, the non-qualified annuity should not be in the name of the irrevocable trust. The irrevocable trust can be the beneficiary under both of those annuities, 
but it should not be retitled, re, you know, the name of the uh, non-qualified annuity changed into the name of the trust. Got it. So it's the beneficiary that we want to set up. It's not the actual ownership of the investment. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And then the protection from Medicaid, and this is something a lot of people are worried about or thinking about. How do I protect my assets from Medicaid if someone, if there's some catastrophic health event? Um, so what we want to do is the way it's sheltered is if the beneficiary is the irrevocable trust, then the assets will pass into the trust with the passing of the owner. And then since it's in the trust, it cannot be uh, attached by Medicaid. That, that's correct. But remember, um, th so the, the trust named as the beneficiary, perfect. Not subject to a, you know any look back from Medicaid after you've passed. But when you're setting up the trust and you're funding the trust, you are putting your house into a trust, either a re revocable or an irrevocable trust, it's still subject to that five-year penalty by Medicaid. All right. So what you said is sometimes you're going to change the ownership of the asset. And if you do that, like if someone owns an airplane, for an example, that is something that you might want to change the ownership from husband and wife to the irrevocable trust because now the clock starts ticking, right? That's what you're yep. saying? Yep, okay. that's correct. Yep. So just to recap, because this seems really complicated for people who it's complicated for me and I'm in this stuff all the time. But where we started, correct me if I'm wrong, Don, is when it comes to living trust, there's well, I'm going to say there's two different kinds. Maybe there's more. There's revocable and there's irrevocable. And it's the irrevocable that's going to be able to protect you, uh, protect your assets for Medicaid, while the revocable will not revocable will protect you from probate and it'll make sure your assets go directly where you want them to go. Is that? Yep, that, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. And then we talked also, and this has come up too, where people are insisting to me that the look back is now seven years for Medicaid and it's just not true, right? It's five years. That's what it is. It's, it's still five years um, for when you go into a nursing home. Still the five year look back for Medicaid, but there's a new look back for home care. Like if you're you're needing Medicaid to um, pay for home care assistance, that look back period is two and a half years. I don't know where people are getting, you know, the seven years for a nursing home from. I hear that all the time and I don't know where they get it from. Yeah. It's crazy, and everyone is so certain it's seven years that they're arguing with me, and I start to wonder if I'm wrong. So thank you. Now I, now I know. It's still five years. And I don't think there's even been any talk of changing legislation to make it seven years, has there? A couple of years ago there was, but it seems like it, you know, it just all petered out. Um, no chatterings, nothing on the horizon. So it's still five years. Okay. We've talked about these living trusts. We've talked about avoiding probate. We've talked about, well, let me say this again. So one of the reasons you want a living trust is you can use it to make sure your assets go directly where you want them to go, just like the beneficiary on your 401k or IRA will do. That's a reason to have one of these living trusts. Um, but in addition to that, what about estate planning purposes? And I'm talking about estate taxes. Where do these, I think these are coming into play also because there's a difference between the estate tax exemption between New York State and the Fed. Is that correct? Yeah. So for calendar year 2022, presently, um, for a New York State estate tax, so when somebody dies, if they have over $6.11 million, your estate will be subject to New York State estate taxes. And, and how New York State figures out how much of an estate tax your estate is going to pay, it depends. It, it, it's a range um, and it starts from like 3% 
all the way up to 16% that you will pay in estate taxes, okay? And that's New York State. For the federal estate tax, if you have more than $12.6 million, okay, then your estate will be subject to a federal estate tax. Just like New York State, how much of a tax you're going to have to pay is, is a range. Um, the percentage ranges from 18% all the way up to 40% of a federal estate tax. And one thing I, I do want to um, remind everybody, because I get this question also, is there is no inheritance tax in New York State. It's not the estate tax, okay? The estate tax is different from an inheritance tax. The estate tax is taxed to your taxable estate when you die. So your estate is paying that tax not your beneficiaries. What I'm imagining is in some states, they probably don't have a state tax, but they have an inheritance tax. That it's that generally one or the other is the way it works, right? Yep, that is correct. Yep. But okay. so no beneficiary, if any beneficiary gets money under an estate in New York State, they don't have to pay tax on that money. There's no inheritance tax to them. Got it. Now, so the difference between New York State and the Fed is uh, the Fed is about double. New York State, you said, is 6.11 million is the exemption. So what that means is as long as your taxable estate is less than 6.1 million in New York, you're not going to pay estate taxes, correct? Right. You won't pay um, both New York State estate taxes if it's below 6.11 million nor will you have to pay a federal estate tax because it's you know well under the the 12 million for federal estate taxes okay now though there there is a difference not just the dollar amount that's exempted between the fed and the state i believe the way the fed works is they've sort of built it in that if you're married you each get your 12.6 million dollar exemption uh, so you don't have to do any kind of fancy estate planning as far as the Fed goes. Just because you're married, you'll each get the $12.6 million exemption, correct? Yep, that, that is correct, yep. But not New York, right? Not New York estate, right. Okay, right. so if you don't do any, so if your taxable estate and you're married is, say, $10 million, there are some things you can do so that husband and wife will both get the $6.1 million exemption. And that's where irrevocable living trusts and other trusts mm -hmm. will come again. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about some common strategies people might use if their estate, if their taxable estate is over 6 million and they're married in New York? If, if you're married, you can each gift up to a total of $30,000 to each of your children, your dependents, all the way along the line, tax-free. So that, that, that's one option to bring down your taxable estate. So we're able, if you're a little over the exemption amount, maybe gifting is a good way to uh, get your taxable estate underneath the thresholds for New York. But if you're taxable estate is more like $10 million, I think what you can do is you can divide your assets, not your IRA assets, but your taxable assets into a trust. Like maybe you want to have an irrevocable living trust. Um, and in this way, uh, and then you set up, you can split your estate in half and each spouse names the trust as the beneficiary. So that when the first passes, their half goes into the uh, irrevocable trust. They use the first exemption, but when the second spouse dies, they get the second exemption. I think I'm off on that somehow a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, when when you know when I meet with clients, they they sometimes look at me when I ask uh, you know details about their assets, about their accounts, retirement and non-retirement accounts. How much do you have? what's in the account, 
And they kind of, you know, like look at me like, well, why do you need to know this? And I need to know that for that particular reason. Even if you're coming to me, you know, to do a simple estate planning, even if it's a will, healthcare proxy, power of attorney, it's my job to, you know, bring that to your attention if you do have a possible taxable estate when you pass away and how you can avoid that. Okay. Now, we've talked a little about IRAs going into trusts and not going into trusts. Can you tell me part of the problem that there's going to be uh, if someone were to name their uh, trust as the IRA beneficiary? How does that impact? Well, if, if the trust is the beneficiary of the IRA, there, there should be no issue. It's, it's the ownership, which would be the issue. Because the only way to have your IRA, the owner, or to have your living trust as the owner of your IRA, you in essence have to close out, cash out your IRA, pay the taxes, to then put it into your living trust. And I advise clients do not do that. You, you don't want to cash out your IRA uh, just to have your, your trust named as the owner. Um, why pay any more taxes than, than what you have to? The less tax that you, that you um, have to pay, the better. Absolutely. And uh, there's another thing I'm thinking about, though. Right now, uh, after the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, we're forced to empty IRAs we inherit over a 10-year period of time. Mm -hmm. And of course, the longer we are able to stretch out those distributions, potentially the smaller the tax will pay is. But isn't it true if uh, trust is the beneficiary of an IRA that it changes from 10 years to five years that you've got to get the money out. That, that is correct. And, and, and something else as I'm thinking about also, um, if, if you have a disabled child mm. and you're naming a disabled child as a beneficiary, either on a bank account, on a life insurance, on your retirement, you have to be very careful because if that disabled child is receiving benefits and if they're the beneficiary of your IRA, right? And you have a disabled child who's on Medicaid and maybe, you know, receiving other type of government benefits. Now they're the beneficiary under your IRA and they got to get that payout after, you know, five years. Guess what? they're going to be removed from their government benefits. So you have to be re you got to be really careful with that. Yeah. So so what do what do you do if uh, a lot of the people I work with the vast majority of their investment assets are in IRAs. So and if you got a special needs child, uh, you can't leave the money directly to them like you say they're going to lose their benefits, but you're also sort of punished if you leave it in a trust. So is it just you got to pick which devil you want to deal with? Is that the way it is? Yeah. I mean, even even under a trust, um, if, if it's a lump sum of money that is going into your trust, you can have a sub trust under your trust for the benefit of your disabled child. It gets a little confusing, right. um, but but there would be, you know, you can do a sub trust so that that disabled child uh, is not going to lose their current benefits. So you have a sub trust. Yeah. That's a part, that's a part of a different trust. That's a part saying. of the same trust. Yeah. So, but if you do that, you're going to have to take all the distributions over five years instead of 10 years. That's, yeah. that's, but if you don't do that, it could be your child loses uh, Medicare, healthcare and, uh, uh, funding for home and all this kind of stuff. Yep. Yep. Well, that's uh, well, that's a tough situation to be in. Okay. And the special needs trust, I, I, I keep coming across more and more people who, who need these sorts of trusts set. Oh, one other thing I'm thinking about is in a will. In a will, there's sort of a trust built into the will. 
So sometimes, like when my kids were younger, the way the will was set up was until they were 25 or something, there was some trustee who would decide, uh, and there were guidelines set up, how much money they would receive had I passed. But that's a trust, right? So you still got the five-year uh, distributions in play with the, with the will uh, sort of governing how the money comes out. That well, right? that, that, that's a that, that's a little different be, because you're the, a trust that's written under a last will and testament is called a testamentary trust. Okay. So, if your IRA, if the beneficiary of your IRA is your estate, in essence, the IRA, the the, the account is closed out, and then the you know the balance in that IRA is is then part of your will, part of your estate. And if you have minor children or children with spe you know special needs, instead of them getting a lump sum of money under your will, then these testamentary trusts will come into play. And then that money is set aside and that money doesn't have to be paid out to those individuals over a certain period of time. It's however long, however long the the parent sets it up under their will, however long they want the payments to be paid out. All right. Well, one key thing you said is the IRA has to be closed. So now we got the lump sum distribution again of everything and all the taxes paid at once. Yep. All right. So there's just <laughs> there's just no getting around this. Uh, if most of your assets that are in IRAs or qualified assets and you've, you've got a special needs trust, a special needs child, it might be a five year distribution instead of a 10. That's just the mm -hmm. way it is. OK. And talking about trust, the reason another reason people like trust is it gives them some amount of control beyond the grave so that uh it gives you the ability sometimes people have uh special children who aren't exactly special needs but people parents think need a little more help with finances for one reason or another and this is where a trust can come in because you can if they're working with you they can you can sort of just brainstorm how this adult child will have access to money throughout their life so the parent it's kind of like the parent is still there deciding. They're just pre-planning this. Is that something you uh, that comes up rather frequently in your practice? Oh, oh yeah. I, I, I mean, I not frequently, but every now and then, um, uh, spouses come to me and and they are concerned one of their children isn't really good with money, um, or maybe one of their children has a has a drug problem or an alcohol problem or something like that and they're they don't want their child to get that money directly after they pass away and the best way to make sure that that doesn't happen is yeah the parents can set up that trust uh either under their will or through their living trust got it all right Let's pivot a little bit. We're talking, uh, when we're talking about these trusts, it's all, a lot of it's about who is the money going to be left to and how is it going to be left to them? But there's another very basic uh, thing that we are all doing, whether you know it or not, you're doing this too, you're choosing this. Um, and it has to do with beneficiary designations. So it's the per capita, versus per stirpes designations. And I think a lot of people uh, aren't really aware of what's going on. So per capita is the, seems to be the default on pretty much everything I touch. Um, why don't you let me know if, that's, if, you, if you see that also, and then you can explain to the people the difference between the two. Well, I think by starting and explaining what each of them are first, um, so per stirpes, you see that a lot in, in a will or even in a trust, okay? And per stirpes is Latin and it actually means like by the branch, which means if, if you have two children 
and one of your children passes away before you under your last will and testament if you say um then it goes to their you know, it, it goes to my children per sterpes if one of your children passes away before you that predeceased child's share will then go directly to that that predeceased child's children it'll be divided between that child predeceased child's children so if you have a child who predeceases you and that child has three children that those three grandchildren will split the predeceased child their parents share okay so that's per stirpes. It, it always jumps to the grandchildren, okay? Not necessarily always equal between all of the surviving grandchildren, but it, it jumps to the grandchildren of any predeceased child. Per capita, however, means if you have two children and one child predeceases you, and you set up your account or under your will or through your um uh, through your trust that the distributions are to be per capita well what that means is then your predeceased child's children receive zero they do not receive their deceased parents share of your estate or even under the, under a trust if it's designated per capita, okay? So per capita, um, the beneficiaries of a predeceased child receive zero unless it's specifically stated in the will that the grandchildren receive the predeceased child's share. But if the designation is in the IRA or the 401k, that goes over the will. It won't go through the will. So that is that's correct. Me. That yeah. is correct. So, okay. And let me just say that again for the people watching. It's really important. We, you know, hopefully you've all got wills. Hopefully they're all, you know, reasonably uh, updated. You know, only uh, you update them after a number of years or life changes go by. But it's really important for everyone to understand that when you die, not everything goes through the will, even though you've got a will. Your IRAs have beneficiaries on them. And no matter what the will says, it's going the way the beneficiary designations are. Uh, so really important to check your beneficiary designations on a regular basis with your financial advisor, or whoever you're working with. Every time I meet with clients, I always review, you know, probate, non-probate. I ask them about beneficiaries on their accounts. And a lot of times, um, if, if the clients, of course, have more than one child, and they may say, well, I designated my daughter as a beneficiary on my life insurance, but not my son. I'm like, well, why didn't you do that? And they're thinking that, well, my daughter will get the money and then split it with her brother. Yeah. And no, um, if whoever you name as the beneficiary on your your retirement accounts, your bank accounts. When you pass away, they are the beneficiary. They get that money if you've designated them. You cannot control beyond the grave that they're supposed to divvy it up among other people unless you specifically have it written down in your will. And chances are, that's still not going to happen because that falls outside of probate, any beneficiary designations. Mm. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's really important. It's really easy to say, well, I'll just do this. And I, you know, I trust my oldest daughter. So I'll just leave to her and let her divvy things up later. But it can just lead to all kinds of problems. So it's really a good idea as you're uh, thinking through how you want things to go, that you meet with an attorney and at least have a conversation about, uh, about how you want things to go and to learn the best practices to make them happen. Yeah, and, and why, while you have the, you know, the opportunity to make your decisions 
on the way you want it to be, you know, your beneficiaries, your, you know, your estate planning documents, you should savor those moments because you're the one in control to be able to do that. If you don't, you're having strangers either try to interpret what you would have wanted, or if you don't have those documents, you don't have beneficiaries, New York State then designates who your beneficiaries are of your estate. And if you have an estranged spouse and you don't have a will, well, guess what? Your estranged spouse may be entitled to your estate. If you have an estranged child that you haven't seen in 10, 15 years, right? You don't have a will, you don't have your estate planning documents, New York State says, well, that child is now a part of your estate and is entitled to get money from your estate. So take advantage when you can, take control of it and make your decisions right now so that nobody else makes those decisions for you. Okay. All right. And let's, let's go back to the per terpes designation. Now let's say an adult child has predeceased uh, the grandparent, let's call them the grandparent. So, but now the per terpes designation comes into play and the, let's, what if the grandchildren are minors and now I'm getting really into a niche, but sometimes uh, they're not crazy about the son-in-law or the daughter-in-law. And if it does go per terpes and the child, the grandchildren are minors, I think effectively what happens is that son-in-law or daughter-in-law becomes the person who's in charge of the money. It has total control, total discretion for what's going to happen. Is that true too? Yeah. So the in in your example, the the son or daughter-in-law um, of, of the of your predeceased grandchild, yeah, they're the legal guardian of the grandchild. So if they're if the grandchild is a minor, the the grandchild's parent is the one who's in charge of that money unless you designated uh, a trustee under your last will and testament to be in charge of that money. Yes. And then again, you've got to do the same thing. How do you do that with an IRA? Um, that that's difficult. I I've seen, um, I've seen companies require the, you know, the parent the, of the grandchild to sign the papers, a surviving parent, and they're the custodian they're yeah they're the ones in in charge um yeah well you, again you just don't have a lot of good options with these qualified accounts these iras with beneficiary designations except right. to put them in a trust and then it's a lump sum distribution and you you, you got to pay all the tax right so you got to make sure your kids marry really good people that you like <laughs> that's what you all got to really work towards i guess <laughs> So with that, I'm sure that's what everyone's going to do. We won't have this problem anymore. That's what everybody hopes for. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, I had uh, some clients in my office just recently, and uh, they were telling me about their friends. They're, they're, they're really close to retirement, this couple. Um, and they were telling me about their friends who are about the same age, and they're having a lot of problems. Their, par their friends' parents are having a lot of health problems. And um, they're actually actually meeting with an elder law attorney now and sort of working through these kinds of things. But this couple, my clients, they're really kind of rattled by what's going on and what they're learning about what can go wrong and how expensive things can be. But they're also, I don't know, they're just not ready to, they're worried, but it's not right in their face right now. So what I suggested to them is a good idea is, boy, you need to go see an elder law attorney and just pay them for their time so you can sit with them and sort of empty your brain of all your worries and concerns and have this expert tell you the way things work and the different strategies that are available to you. Maybe they don't even need to do anything else right now I think it really could be if they just talked to an expert, a lot of their fears would be alleviated 
and maybe they could come up with an action plan over the next five or 10 years of steps that they should be taking. So my question for you is, do you think that's a good idea? And number two is, um, you know, people are just afraid, I think, to work with attorneys, financial planners too, because they don't understand what we charge or how much things cost. So if someone came to you and said, I'm worried about these kinds of issues, I want to talk to you. How do you charge them? How does that work? Well, um, here at the at our firm, we charge a an initial consult fee. So some offices don't charge a fee, but you may only get like a half hour meeting or so with the attorney. Your questions may not all be answered in that brief meeting, but we do and I do an hour and a half. Um, I take the time with the clients um and and try to answer all of their questions and and i know that new clients that i meet you know they're yet yeah, they're all they're nervous because they don't know what to expect right they don't know what to ask they're not certain if they're asking the right questions but that's why you know i take the hour and a half sometimes up to two hours to sit to talk with them i don't rush them granted sometimes they still feel overwhelmed which is understandable, but even after the meeting, I always make myself available. You want to call me you know, a day or two later, you have more questions. I don't care. Call me. I'm not going to charge you for that time. All right. And for this hour and a half long consultation, what is the fee for that nowadays? If, they, if people were calling you? Well, our fee is $350 to meet for an hour and a half. Okay. That sounds really pretty reasonable for an hour and a half time of uh, an attorney with 25 years experience. So that sounds great. Yep. Yep. Money well spent. I think so. Um, all right, Don, we covered a lot of ground today. Is there anything else you can think of that maybe we, that we should be adding to this conversation before we uh, finish for today? Yeah, one thing that I want to mention, because um, I, I think in, in our last discussion, Peter, um, I mentioned something about the change in the, the Medicaid, uh, the asset, the eligibility for New York State. So since we last spoke, all right, um, Governor Hochul has signed uh, new legislation, which will take effect come January of 2023 for Medicaid. Just the legislation included a whole bunch of other things, but one of the parts of it was, um, was focused on Medicaid. So right now, if somebody goes into a nursing home, okay, right now until the end of this year, you can only have $16,800 in assets. And that's not counting a house and that's not counting one car. So you go in a nursing home, whether you're married or not, the person in the nursing home can only have up to $16,800 in their name, okay? Come January of 2023, that is all changing. So come January of 2023, if you're in a nursing home, you can then have up to $28,134 in assets. And that still doesn't count the, the value of your house or one car. So the amount of assets that you can have when you go into a nursing home in 2023 is almost doubled, okay? So that's good, that's good. Originally, um, the it looked like the governor was going to sign legislation not counting any assets. So basically exempting everything that you owned um, to qualify for Medicaid. But the governor, I guess, decided, no, we'll just increase the amount of money that you can keep in resources. So that's your resources. Income wise, now for income wise, for Medicaid, and this is Medicaid home care. You're, you're not in a nursing home, you're applying for Medicaid for home care. Presently right now, 
your monthly income can be no more than $934 a month to qualify for Medicaid outside of the nursing home. Come January 2023, that dollar amount is now increasing to $1,563 a month to qualify for Medicaid. So uh, not, not quite a you know, doubling of the 934, but much more than the $934 that you can have right now to qualify for Medicaid. So the idea with the increase in the income eligibility and the asset eligibility is that more people will be able to save more money, okay? That they're not going to have to completely deplete all of their assets. They'll be able to save a lot more money. But still, that being said, Remember, if anything that goes through probate, anything that ends up going through probate after you have been on Medicaid during your lifetime, Medicaid takes those monies back of whatever goes through probate. So that's why it's important to do your beneficiary designations, do your trust so that things do not go through probate. Okay, so probate is where Medicaid gets reimbursed as much as they can. Yep, that's correct. Yep. Okay. So it used to be nine thirty four a month you're allowed to keep. In January it'll be fifteen sixty three. But let's say your Social Security is uh, two thousand and sixty three. So what that means is, uh, like in my case, if it were me, I'm only allowed to keep the fifteen sixty three. The extra five hundred gets paid back to New York State to Medicaid. It's not like my wife's getting that extra $500, right? No, not, not necessarily. If, if you have more, come January of 2023, if you have more than the, the 1563 in monthly income, say you do have, um, you know, $2,063, right. that extra $500 can still be sheltered in, in, a, in a special type of a trust so it's still not counted by Medicaid if you're applying for Medicaid and hmm. you still have use of that extra $500 and on paper, your income will still look like it's $2,063. Well, wow. we're going to have to talk more about this <laughs> next time. I can see that's going to be a big topic to cover. No problem. No problem. So, uh, all right, I'm gonna, I guess that's about it for today. So Don, I wanna thank you for joining us. We'll have you back uh, next month or in six weeks, something like that. And for all you folks out there, if you've got questions for us, uh, send an email to the office, service at hafnerfinancial.com. And please make sure you uh, like the video. If you liked it, like it, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell, and then you'll be notified every time we uh, put up a, no a new video. So, so that's it for today. Thanks for joining us and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Peter. Nice seeing you.